Today on Government Matters, a big promotion for the next head of the General Services Administration. Two Obama veterans on their plan to make the GSA administrator the government's COO. 88% of employees at OMB could be fired before President Trump leaves office. Congressman Don Beyer tells you how cutting the money flow could smother Schedule F. And the number one story of the week, the transition begins. Two former OPM directors on what the president-elect's appointees will be up against. Government Matters starts right now. From Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Francis Rose. Thanks for watching the weekend edition of Government Matters, the only show covering the latest news, trends, and topics that matter to the business of government. I'm your host, Francis Rose. The next leader of the General Services Administration should serve as chief operating officer for the country. It is one recommendation from members of President-elect Biden's transition team for improving government IT. Ann Duncan is Chief Technology Officer for State and Local Government at Dell. She's former Chief Information Officer at the Environmental Protection Agency. Greg Godbout is Director of Digital Services at Fearless. He's former Chief Technology Officer at EPA. Folks, welcome. Thanks very much for coming on the program. Ann, I want to start with you. What was the impetus for looking at what you looked at in this work? Yeah, thanks, Francis. It's really great to see you again. Um, the reason that we looked at this is, is, is Greg and I both realized, and it wasn't a hard realization, that we've seen a lot of innovation in the government. We've seen a lot of great things happen, but what we haven't seen is that innovation scale across entire agencies or across the entire government. We see a project, two projects, three projects, or a group of people within an organization who are doing something great, but we're just not seeing that level of change. And so we're continuing to see the things that we created the digital services movement to end, which are failed projects and, and really slow delivery. Greg, you and Ann are proposing making the General Services Administrator the chief operating officer, as I mentioned at the beginning, and centralizing a lot of these digital operations at GSA. Why is that the right place for this centralization to happen, Greg? Yeah, it's a good question, and thank you for having us on. I we we went back and forth on this one so um we we talked about some potential things at like omb uh things like that U ultimately what we wanted to see was an organization that's strictly dedicated to um delivery effectively right like and and the implementation of it and we felt that with the services and centralized services that uh tts has been setting up um that that it, GSA was sort of a natural place to sort of build those types of services that can be used by other agencies to do it. So if you lift it up there, you do it. Also, um, OMB has a lot of like policy and oversight roles and things like that, that we just ultimately felt that like at GSA, it made sense um, from their implementation standpoint that you would get a lot of those early adopters. People would be more likely to sort of work with a group um, that necessarily wasn't also doing like the, the oversight and the budget, stuff like that, so. Greg, by mentioning the technology transformation service at GSA, you get at the heart of one of the IT debates in the Obama administration, which was, what should live in the digi U.S. Digital Service and what should live at TTS? What does that look like under the model that you and Ann have developed? Oh, I, I think you could, I think there's a lot of flexibility under the model that we've developed, but my, my recommendation, and I'd be curious, Ann, if you wanna disagree with any of this, but um, my, my recommendation would be that if you look at like U.S. Digital Services and things like that, that they focus on sort of presidential priorities and um, intervention-like engagements. So your things that are sort of important and urgent, right? And when you look at like GSA and TTS, there you're taking appropriated dollars from agencies and they are choosing to spend that money with them. And in that sense, you really need your early adopters. And so I'd like to see the transformation implementation go from that route. And then you could probably heavily support that inside OMB with the, CIA, with the US uh, CIO's office being more geared towards the transformation work as opposed to the intervention work. And you want to critique that on the fly? Uh, you know, I rarely want to critique Greg because he's a smart guy, and I think that I would approach it the same way. We've always talked about the fact that, it, you know, USDS is there to fight fires, 
and 18F and TTS uh, are there to help build buildings, and I think that's a great, uh, great way to go about it. And you and Greg have four steps in this proposal. The first one is the GSA step that we talked about a moment ago. Second one's inspiring the innovation workforce with the Presidential Leadership Fellow. We'll let that one stand for now. The third one's guide government leaders with the Agency Transformation Playbook, and I'd love to have you come back and talk about that one. Um, the other one I want to touch on today is ensuring continuity by establishing a transformation advisory board. What does that look like and what's the model for that, Ann? So the idea of the Transformation Advisory Board is to have a group of, of senior leaders who will span uh, administrations so that, you know, we did, did a pretty good job between the Obama and the Trump administration of people keeping this going, but there's no guarantee that from administration to administration work will continue. So just like the Defense Board, this board would be an opportunity to really uh, make sure that you have people who aren't terming out when the president leaves who are in very senior positions, who can help guide innovation throughout the organization and provide some real horsepower around recommendations and mandates. The Defense Innovation Board, Greg, is, as Ann mentioned a moment ago, you're one of the models that you're thinking about there. And I wonder if there's also either a role for an organization like the Chief Information Officers Council and the other councils or for a structure like that um, that will perpetuate that kind of knowledge transfer and, and, and momentum that Ann's describing. Yeah, I, I think I think again, this is another um, recommendation we have that there's room for for movement underneath on how you actually implement it. I think the the most important aspect is um, sort of the independence from the political nature of things coming in because um, you you there's a there's a tendency to look with within the political parties, there's a tendency to look within their own political parties and see what innovations they did. But there's things happening at all times that you want to like, hey, this is really important. This is exciting. We need to continue this thing forward. And I think that's easier to do when you have a continuous group watching it live, as opposed to like, oh, there's a transition happening and let's figure it out now. No, we've been working with these groups. We've seen the successes. We've seen them pivot on their failures and lessons. And we think this deserves investment and should go forward. Greg Godbout and Duncan, thanks very much for joining me. It's great to have you on. Up next, smothering Schedule F, where it counts. Straight ahead on Government Matters, Congressman Don Beyer on cutting the money flow to kill an executive order. You're watching ABC7. Welcome back. 13 members of the House of Representatives believe the upcoming appropriations bill may be the easiest way to stop the Trump administration from executing on its executive order to make it easier to fire federal employees. The Office of Management and Budget has already announced plans to convert 88 percent of its workforce to the new Schedule F. Democratic Congressman Don Beyer represents Virginia's 8th district. He joined 12 of his colleagues on a letter to Appropriations Committee chairs and ranking members. Congressman, welcome. Thanks very much for coming on the program. This letter that you signed says we write to request the forthcoming continuing resolution or omnibus spending bill include language that reverses the implementation of this executive order and requires the immediate return of any federal employee reclassified pursuant to it. Is this a money issue or a legislative language issue that you're pursuing here, sir? Oh, this is very much a legislative language. <clears throat> it's really not about the spending of federal dollars, Francis. It's about the character of our civil service. More than 140 years ago, we passed the Pendleton Act, which said that our civil service, the federal employees who serve all of us, uh, need to be largely politically independent, not Democrats, not Republicans, and certainly not on the job. And so the presidents have the opportunity to, to appoint a relatively small percentage of the workforce, you know, less than 5% as Schedule C appointments. Think Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, the Assistant Secretaries that are loyal to the president reflect his or her values. But the most federal employees should be out there serving the American people, not, you know, swinging left or swinging right, depending on who the president is. The letter that you signed says, please consider using some or all of the legislative language in the Saving the Civil Service Act. What's the essence of that? Is it basically we don't want Schedule F revert to the Pendleton Act, or is it more complex than that, Congressman? No, I think it's just pretty much just let's get rid of the Schedule F. 
You know, you go almost back to Andrew Jackson, way before you and I were born, when the federal government was just full of political cronies. And so it would empty out every four years or every eight years. And what you want instead are professional scientists at the EPA, at NOAA, professional scientists in the labs, and, uh, and especially at the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, where they're trying to do thoughtful, long-term policy decisions that help us spend the money. Now they've, they've taken 88% of the OMB and made them basically at will employees. They can all be fired between now and January 20th. What have you learned in, since the time you were on the program uh, the last time and we discussed the idea you wanted to learn more about who was being classified where? What have you learned since then? Other than the report that we've seen about the Office of Management and Budget classifying 88% of its employees as Schedule F, I have not seen other reports. Have you, sir? Yeah, Francis, that, that, that's really an interesting twist that you bring up because one of the things that we worry a little about, I mean, like really little, is the, the notion of so-called burrowing in. When a political appointee of a given president finds a way to convert herself, himself, into a career civil service appointee. And, you know, that's not a, a completely inappropriate thing. A lot of people get there and say they, they love their job and they like to stay. Um, but with the Schedule F, if you can suddenly fire 85% of the employees and replace them with Schedule F employees that don't have to go through the vetting process, you could transform a whole government overnight in ways that it would not be good for the American public. If Schedule F were to disappear tomorrow, Congressman, what would that say to you about the burrowing in issue? Would that worry you as much as it does now, the idea that someone wants to convert from political to career? And how does one go about ascertaining whether someone's doing it for altruistic reasons or for ideological reasons? Yeah, I, I think it, um, it would make me worry much, much less about it. Francis, as you know, a dozen years ago, I led the transition team for President-elect Obama at Department of Commerce. And one of the charges was look and see who's burrowing in. And 12 years later, I can't think of a single person that we thought had burrowed in inappropriately. And so you're just trying to be alert to that. That's going to be a handful of people rather than 88% of the workforce in a given agency. This letter is dated uh, within the last several days, sir. Have you gotten any response from the leaders on the appropriations committees about whether this language could actually make it into the omnibus bill that it appears at least that your side and, and the Senate side of the Hill will vote on soon? Francis, I'm actually really hopeful about it because this should not be a partisan issue. This is not Democrats versus Republicans. This is trying to um, play political games with the civil service that serves every American. You know, I had a chance to be in the State Department for four years, and I never knew who those Foreign Service officers that worked with me were for. They were very careful about keeping their political beliefs wrapped up because they knew that they had to serve whoever it was. And I certainly tell you, from our constituent service, um, we never think to ask a constituent what their political values or appropriates are. We're, we're there to serve them, every American. To the issue of bipartisanship, sir, we've tried to identify since this executive order was signed some expert who has served previously in a Republican administration who would be willing to come on the air and talk about the potential benefits of Schedule F. We've been unable to do so. Have you had those conversations with your Republican colleagues currently sitting in Congress about whether they support this or not? I have, and I haven't found anybody that supports it. Uh, because most people, you know, if you're going to be in in political life, you have an obligation to think long term, to think about the unintended consequences of any legislation. So my Republican friends have to be thinking about four years from now, eight years from now, when they perhaps elected a Republican president again. What do they really want us stuffing all these agencies with our Democratic operatives? No. Now this, this, this is a commitment to good government uh, across party lines. Congressman Don Beyer, thank you very much for joining me. As always, I appreciate your time, thank sir. Thank you, Francis. Up next, the number one story of the week. Straight ahead on Government Matters, President-elect Biden's first round of cabinet picks. An all-star panel tells you what they're up against coming next. You're watching ABC7. And now the number one story of the week. President-elect Joe Biden announced some of his cabinet choices this week. The Senate has not indicated yet, though, 
when it might start the confirmation process for those nominees. Jeff Pond is senior advisor and consultant at Big Sky Associates. Janice Lachance is executive vice president at the American Geophysical Union. Both are former directors of the Office of Personnel Management. Welcome to both of you. Janice, I want to start with you. You told me fairly recently that your confirmation process both times was fairly easy. What are President-elect Biden's choices up against? What will they face in the next several weeks? Well, fairly easy is relative, Francis. We, um, I was very fortunate. I was already working at OPM when uh, I was nominated. So I had the advantage of knowing about the agency, knowing the staff, and knowing the Senate staff. But what's interesting is in this case, this is the first time since 1989 that a president is going to enter office with a Senate uh, of the opposite party. And I think that's going to make a tremendous difference. Uh, I'm not sure good or bad. What I'm hoping is that the Senate will realize that these nominees are expert in their fields. They have a lot of experience. They've been in the public eye. They have a very visible uh, record and will move very, very quickly because there's no doubt, Francis, the country's in crisis. We have to start moving immediately to get leadership in place to really trigger the um, the uh, the wheels of government and make sure that we can start on a path to recovery. Jeff, welcome. You sent me a 15-item punch list that you uh, went through to become the uh, director of OPM. Is there any way to truncate some of those items to try to m move these people with speed the way that Janice uh, described a moment ago? No. Uh, there's no way of shortening the process. I think um, there's a reason why there is a process for vetting. It's making sure that the nominee is qualified, the, making sure that everybody um, is in tune with the, the candidate uh, from Office of Government Ethics to the Senate staff who staff up the, uh, the Senate confirmations to your own uh, receiving agency, and they brief you up. So. You know, it's a really long process. You have to get nominated by the by the uh, president first. Uh, the announcement has to get out. You have to meet all the political and career team in an unofficial capacity. Then you have to brief, uh, get briefings from each and every one of the components. And with our 18 cabinet level agencies, there are large agencies under there, so there's a lot of detail there. Uh, then you have uh, mock hearings where uh, staff actually portray uh, senators that will grill you, so you have a mock interview, if you will, and then you get a date from your Senate committee, and then you do the hearing. Uh, you will wait whether or not the committee votes you out or doesn't vote you out unanimously or um, or not, and if there are delays, there are delays, and it's uh, really the, the committee that uh, permits you to go to the Senate, uh, the Senate floor, the Senate majority uh, uh, leader uh, basically sets that date and then uh, hopefully uh, you get endorsed uh, by the Senate uh, and recommended to the president. The Secretary of State signs and bosses the great seal of the United States on your appointment. The president signs the appointment and then uh, the federal judge or uh, another political appointed Senate confirm or POTUS or VEPUS uh, basically uh, swears you in and hopefully you have a trusted, qualified team that plays well with others. That's the process. It's a long process, and there are about a thousand names that will need to be filled in the coming months. What do we do in the meantime to try to get people into these seats as quickly as possible? Janice, what are the tools at the disposal of Vice President of uh, President-elect Biden's team to be able to try to bring the other folks in? Mm -hmm. So the. The Biden transition is doing a great job at identifying talent and really thinking about what, who's out there now who can go into these positions who, that don't need Senate confirmation. And that's going to be key to maintaining momentum, key to maintaining uh, the or launching the new programs that the Biden administration wants to get going. So I think you will see a very, very quick and speedy uh, filling of those positions, the non-career SES, the Schedule C positions, hopefully they'll get um, filled quickly, expeditiously, 
And hopefully the Senate will see that there is an urgency here in getting those cabinet and uh, Senate confirmed positions in place as well. There is a history in this country of having hearings for some cabinet officials before the inauguration. There's a history of cabinet members being cons confirmed on inauguration day. People literally leave the, uh, the west front of the Capitol and go into session and confirm uh, some of the cabinet nominees. So I'm hoping that the this Senate will operate in good faith that way, move things very, very quickly so that we can get started tackling some of these issues that are facing us. Jeff, 30 seconds left. What kind of timeline do you expect to see for both the political appointees that require Senate confirmation and the Schedule C's that don't? Uh, three to six months is usually uh, the majority of, of the people, about a thousand people um, that need to be confirmed, about 1,200 people at, that are PAS. Uh, Non-PAS or the uh, political team at the White House, there's about 400 of those people. Um, and then there's about 700 SES that are non-career. And then you have Schedule C's and there are about 1,500 people there. It's a large undertaking. It's 4,000 people in three to six months, and there's over you know 100,000 to 400,000 uh, resumes, if you will, that have to get reviewed and approved by the team and go through each and every one of the process. Jeff Pond, Janice Lachance, thanks very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Francis. Don't forget, Take if you care. miss an episode of Government Matters, you can find it on our website, govmatters.tv, and you get a preview of every one of our newscasts by signing up for our daily program guide. You just text GovMatters to the number 58671. I'm back in two minutes. That's the latest from Washington. Join me weeknights at 8 and 11 on WJLA 24-7 News and next Sunday morning at 1030 on ABC7 to stay plugged in on issues that matter to the business of government. Thanks for watching. I'm Francis Rose.